Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. I'm grateful to the ICD for the opportunity to engage with you today and for the privilege of listening and interacting with colleagues from all over the world who are doing their bit in trying to create a better world where we can coexist peacefully despite, despite the fact that as human beings we are packaged differently, primarily in terms of color, culture, and religion. I thought I would engage you just very briefly around the intersection between human rights, culture, and justice. Hence the idea of justice beyond what we know. Mostly I would like us to think about justice as you understand it from the day you were born and what you were taught at school. What does it mean? And have you ever thought about the relationship between justice and human rights? And have you ever thought about the notion of justice as we understand it on a day-to-day -day basis and its implications for human rights if we implement that notion of human rights? I mean, if we implement that notion of justice in a multicultural society without adapting our notion of justice to a multicultural society. My focus is on one size fits all, which obviously is the predominant paradigm of justice, isn't it? Justice for me is the same as justice for you. But is that so? A few years ago, it was in the 80s, a friend of mine went shopping in China. And, but before, she hadn't gone to shop for clothes. She was a business person. She had gone to shop for something else. And they lost her baggage on the flight, and she had nothing, no underwear, no clothes, nothing whatsoever. The concierge advised her to go around shopping. This is the 80s um, for underwear and for clothes. She went all over. She found nothing that could feed her. But most of the shops had the sign that said, one size fits all. And when she spoke to the shop assistants, they would say, no, it's one size fits all now. But does one size fit all? Think about it. I don't know how many of you as children watched or read Alice in Wonderland. And Alice in Wonderland went into Wonderland and they invited her to a tea party. And when she walked in, nobody told her how to open the door. When she tried to open the door, eventually they told her that it swings both ways. But how would she have known she was, she was a stranger? And at the tea party, if you remember those books on Alice in Wonderland, all of the chairs were small, all of the cups were small, but worse than anything else, nobody had vacated a chair or added a chair so that Alice could fit in. Let's reflect on that in multicultural societies, especially multicultural societies that started as homogeneous societies from a point of culture. I would say societies are never totally homogeneous. Sociologists would tell you that even if you were all English, there would still be subcultures within your society. There would still be a different culture for grown-ups and a different culture for young people. 
Uh, as we can see, for example, right now, we barely understand millennials because they have a culture of their own, a beautiful culture. So I do understand that uh, cultural diversity does not only come in when you have foreigners, but the situation is exacerbated when you bring in people from a totally different paradigm of existence. How does this relate to justice and justice and human rights in a multicultural society? Is justice as we know it truly just? Just reflect on that for a moment. We all talk about the indivisibility of human rights. That's what the Vienna Convention told us in 1993. Human rights are interdependent and indivisible. And everyone is entitled to human rights. We talk about equal human rights for all. But how real is that when one size fits all? As a public protector, which is an ombudsman, similar to Ms. Francini, I had a case where the issue of cultural difference and justice was at the center of the dispute. A certain Mr. G built social housing for government. We have something that is called an RDP housing program. And obviously government does not have its own construction company and its subcontracts. In this particular case, government subcontracted to Mr. M and Mr. M subcontracted to Mr. G's company. And halfway through the building, government, or this was a provincial government, or this was a municipality, the officials in the municipality took away the, the money that they had been given by national government as a conditional grant and squandered it on their own needs, internal needs. Not, not stole it, but squandered it on things that were staff issues. So halfway through the construction, there wasn't enough money. But Mr. G was told, proceed. By that time, they had finished the building except the roof. He was given a verbal instruction, proceed and build the roof. So Mr. G, understanding that when people in government say, proceed, they will pay, their word means something. He had no reason to believe there was anything wrong. So he built, continued with the RTP housing, and finished those houses. That's so low-cost housing for poor people. And it's an important program in terms of socioeconomic rights in South Africa. It gives people an asset. It gives them a roof over their heads. Government accepted those houses. The mayor, as they usually do, had an event <coughs> where they were going to open the key. And usually, they choose a grandmother. We refer to them as the Gogo Dlamini, you know, because you know, who doesn't like the cute face of a grandmother? And when they open these events to show delivery to people, they bring a grandmother in and a key is being given to her and she talks about how happy she is that government has delivered. It was close to the elections. Mr. G now went back to government to request the money for the roof. Government refused to pay on two grounds. The first ground was, we didn't contract with you. We contracted with Mr. M. But when government received the house, there wasn't a question of who built the house. Government just took the house. They don't build themselves. The second reason they declined to pay was that the instruction to proceed when money ran dry was given verbally, it was not in writing. But again, when government delivered those houses to the people, 
as part of showing that we deliver to our people, there were no questions asked about where did the money for the roof come from? Mr. G, Mr. G went to court and the court upheld government's objection on, on the two grounds. There being no verbal instruction and, I mean, there being no written instruction which changes the contract. And, but more importantly, more importantly in law, you must have local standing. You must show that you have a legal relationship with the person you are suing and that they had a duty to behave in a particular way towards you. So Mr. G, in terms of justice as we know it, normal justice, that was the end of the journey for him. He needed money to appeal, he could have appealed, and maybe the high court and the finally the constitutional court would have arrived at the same thing because the decisions to be made by our courts have to be lawful. But let me ask you, colleagues, from a human rights point of view, were Mr. G's human rights violated? Certainly. There's a relationship between justice and human rights. The right to economic activity in South Africa is a constitutionally protected right. But after he wasn't paid, he couldn't proceed with his company. He faced liquidation. Worse, he faced having his house also foreclosed by the bank. And even worse, he faced disintegration of the family unit. As an ombudsman, as a pub protector, I've seen families disintegrate because of some improper action that happened in government somewhere, and people then turn on each other because of anger and despair. And where does the cultural issue come into it? Mr. Gokha is a simple person who comes from a society where if I give you my word, it means something. The courts are saying it should have been in writing. But he didn't know that it must always be in writing. He just thought that people in authority, if they ask you to do something that is an honest thing to do, you're not stealing, and, and they proceed and take that benefit, then you can do that with the understanding that you'd be paid. And that's justice as we know it. I've discussed this case with judges and we laughed about it because the ending was great. The ending was great in this particular case because there was an alternative for Mr. G. After he failed from the courts, he came to the pub protector office in our province in the Eastern Cape. The first time the lawyers saw it, most of our investigators are lawyers, they told him, no, you have no local standard and the matter has already been heard by a court of law, you go. When we then had a pub protector conversation with the nation where we had stakeholder consultations, Mr. Goha and his wife came over to, to meet with us and asked us to reconsider this matter. That's an internal review process. We looked at his matter and we said the court was right in terms of justice as we know it. But can we help him? Me and my deputy reviewed this matter together. We met with them. We both agreed, yes, we can. <laughs> because we operate on a slightly different paradigm. We complement the courts. We don't ask, do you have local standard? We don't ask, was the contract amended in writing? Because we don't enforce the law of contract. We don't enforce civil law. We enforce proper conduct in state affairs. So our questions are slightly different. Our question starts with what the Americans call state action. So in our case, we start by saying, was the conduct in state affairs? And then the second question was, was that conduct improper? Did it constitute maladministration, abuse of power? Also, in this particular case, we said, was their conduct in state affairs? Yes. 
a municipality put out a tender for the construction of RDP houses. Was that conduct improper? Yes, the municipality chowed the money that was a conditional grant purely for housing and the money was used for something else. Secondly, the municipality had a duty under the law, under section 195 of our constitution, to make sure that members of the public always know what their rights and responsibilities are and had no right to create an uncertainty by not dealing with citizens using the legal instruments. It is government's duty to make sure that contracts are always in writing and amendments to those contracts are done in writing. So if government failed to do its job, it can't be Mr. G who now has to suffer for government's conduct. So we've asked the third question, was there, did, was somebody prejudiced or suffered an injustice because of government's inaction or improper action? And the answer was yes. And then the last question is, what will it take to place whoever has been prejudiced or suffered an injustice as close as possible to where they would have been had justice done the right thing? I mean, had government done the right thing? And we decide, okay, what it would take to place Mr. G as close as possible to where he would have been is to get government to pay the money plus interest. And that's the decision I made. And when I did this presentation to my colleagues who were judges at a, an event where I was invited to speak, judges agreed with me that any, any institution such as the power protector becomes an alternative or a, a complementary institution to advance justice. But in this particular case, we are having an institution that also advances justice in a manner that takes into account the differences in capacities to understand and use the law in a multicultural or in a diverse society. So is justice as we ordinarily know it truly just? My answer to you would be not always. I come from a society where there was always a gap between law and justice. Apartheid was a law and it was enforced through the law. Trevor Noah, a comedian who's now with, um, what is it? The Daily, the Daily Show, talks about apartheid in his book, Born a Crime. So the law made his birth a crime. Was that just? Absolutely not. And that's something we have to bear in mind in, 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 in these multicultural societies. But I would like us to not just think about justice in terms of enforcement in the courts. Because the scenario I've given you at the moment was a scenario where justice as we know it gets undermined in the courts because of a uni paradigm in terms of how the law operates. But is justice only undermined in a multicultural society when we go to court? Do we only become unjust when we go to court? On a way here, on a British Airways flight, I read a story about a passenger who refused to sit next to a Muslim. So if we think about the paradigm of justice as an issue to be concerned about how the courts and lawyers operate, let's reflect on this incident. Let's reflect on the human dignity of the Muslim passenger. Let's reflect on the implications of creating a world that is based on friendship and prosperity for all. That's just one incident, because that's an incidence between just two people. But who is the victim going to talk to? How will they feel about it? I, I, I hope you'll agree with me that they will feel they were unjustly treated. We don't only feel injustice in courts. Everyday things, can be an injustice. That's why people talk about social justice, environmental justice, etc. 
language is an issue of justice. I remember, uh, again, one of the cases that came to our office was the case where a Vietnamese man was allowed to walk. Rhino poaching case. We, in South Africa, we have a major problem of saving the rhino. This Vietnamese guy who was said to be a kingpin of poaching was made to walk because they said he had been to court several times and no Vietnamese uh, interpreter had been provided. Labor on a day-to-day -day basis. We've been talking for several days here and at the Tolbeck Forum where I was two weeks ago, we were talking again about the refugee issue. All of us are concerned about refugees, me too. But what about the locals? Have we thought about their own sense of justice? Is it a justice issue where an English young person who would like to be a waitress says, seemingly I can never get a job because all of the waitresses that get hired seem to be coming from other countries? Is it unjust when a local um, guy who wants to be a gardener feels that they can never get a job even as a gardener because in most countries people would rather hire a foreigner as a gardener? What about their own justice issues? Or is it not an issue of justice? I'll leave it for you to decide. Is it not a justice issue? How about the business person who says the foreigners are coming with better business skills and they are better coordinated and they have thrown us out of business? Is it a business a justice issue for them? But what about the locals? If now you've addressed the issues of locals, what about the foreigners who are called names, who are told to dress in a particular way? Just lastly, on the issues of a, a paradigm of justice that transcends the courts. Democracy. As we know it, as it was invented years ago, we all accept that it's okay that democracy is only about locals voting. Nobody has ever questioned why can't foreigners vote or have some say whatsoever. That's our notion of democracy, because it was created when villages were still only locals, isn't it? Therefore, democracy was for citizens. But there are countries where 10% of the people in that country are foreigners who are either refugees or residents. And we think it's just that they should have no say. And I'm not saying they should vote. I'm just saying, is it just that they should have no say? Yet they, too, are being governed. Life has changed. These notions were created by Aristotle and many other people, and, but life, life has changed. Then lastly, yesterday I asked the presidents, the former presidents, about Europe. Who is your neighbor if you are Europe? Should it concern? you that something is happening in Africa, something is happening in Asia, something is happening in America. Should it concern you as Europeans? Majority of them said no. It reminded me of a story I told last year about uh, people being in the same boat. And there were two guys on the one side of the boat and two guys on the other side of the boat. And the, on the one side of the boat, there was a hole and those guys were busy trying to fix that hole. And when one of the guys on the leaking side of the boat asked the others, why won't you help? One of the other guys said, well, the leak is not on our side of the boat. It's none of our business. But were they right? The reality is that if there's a leak on the boat, 
it will sink. The advantage for those who are on the other side of the boat is simply that they will sink later, but sink they will. But the other issue that the colleagues didn't bear in mind is many of the problems that we experience in the world are due to past actions by those people and other people as well. Africa was not only economically raped during slavery and colonialism. Today, we talk about illicit transfers. We, we talk about illicit financial outflows. And some banker said to me, it's not illicit financial outflows because some of it is legal. Then I would then say, maybe it's not illicit all the time, but a lot of it is unethical because people use the laws in a distorted way to find a way to siphon money out of their businesses in Africa and other parts of the world and take that money elsewhere. They then pay less tax in those countries where they are supported, but worse, sometimes they even pay nothing to their local investors because they will declare no interest. Because what they do then, they do um, transfer charges where they would say, okay, somebody in, in, uh, in Berlin should charge me for, for consultation but, and, and then uh, overcharge for that. that then take, but that company would still be owned by them in a different capacity. It's a very complex issue. I don't want to take us there. All I'm saying is that we have to be careful about what we regard as just and our own contribution to an unjust world and how that world then undermines human rights. But not just only of the immediate victims of the injustice, because it takes me to the, ne to the next point, which is when justice fails, what happens? It is said violence is the language of the disempowered. But violence is not the whole story. Firstly, when it comes to violence, we do know that when people are disempowered, they are most likely to maybe gravitate towards Boko Haram, ISIS, etc. Those that we have left behind in our countries. I'm not saying those structures are okay. All I'm saying, if we're gonna rescue our young people, at least those who voluntarily go into those structures, we need to find out what is it that makes them feel left behind in our own communities. Especially in a multicultural society. There's a movie on British Airways again, uh, on um, Daniel something, I Daniel something. This guy uh, is, is, is not technically competent, he's an old man. He goes through all of these structures of bureaucracy looking for a, a medical um, social security. Well, by the time he gets it, he's dead. Let's just leave it like that. But the moral of that story is how we create systems that make people dysfunctional because there's no match between how people are able to cope with bureaucracy and the systems we create. And when this guy keeps going, people are saying, these are the rules, but why do we make rules? We make rules to create better functional society. The only reason we have laws and rules is that we have to regulate our coexistence so that we can exist better, so that we, there can be more peace and there, there can be mutual prosperity. When those rules break spirits, when those rules reinforce indignity, when those rules break souls, why should we worship the rules? Why shouldn't we change them? If I go back to Mr. G's case, why can't the court change the rules? That's another story. But when justice fails, some may result for, to, to injustice, some may result to violence, but others don't. They opt out of the system, and that would undermine democracy. In South Africa, there are 57 million South Africans the biggest party in South Africa has just about one million people. 
out of probably about 30 million that could potentially be decision makers in a democracy. That means the majority of that 30 million have no interest in joining a political party. Why? I don't know. But what then does it mean is that only one million people select the politicians that are more likely to govern. Only one million people um, participate in selecting the president, but it gets even more complex. It's not one million that do so. The people who select the politicians, the people who select the president, are not the one million members. They are those who attend meetings. And most political parties organize meetings during the day on a working day, when most working people are at work. So the people who really decide democracy are a minority. <laughs> so is democracy just? I'm not saying do away with democracy. I'm just saying, is democracy as we know it at the moment just? Or should we be thinking about other things we could add to ensure participatory democracy? People say it's the will of the majority. It's the will of a minority of a minority. The rest are operating outside the system. And that's what worries me, is that when people feel the system is not working, they don't always go violent. They often just operate outside the system. And it's our job to find a way to bring them back because we don't want them outside the system. Because if they're outside the system, they will not have trust in the system. And the Chief Justice of South Africa refers to something he calls self-help. If the system doesn't work, people resort to self-help. And it's not just self-help against the system, it's self-help against each other. If somebody rapes my sister and I think the court system is not gonna help, I just go shoot them. And that creates problems, it creates a cycle of violence and all other things. Mental health is one way also people react to feeling disadvantaged, feeling disempowered. It might not be immediate violence, but it might later be violence. Because they say peace is not the absence of war. Or peace is more than the absence of war. Well, how do we resolve this? This is my suggestion, is that from a, from a, a justice point of view, from making sure that justice responds to human rights in a multicultural society, the first thing is making sure that we understand that injustice happens every day. So injustice is not the failure of the court system, it's how we treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not always because we're bigots, it is sometimes when we do what we ordinarily do every day, like the Mr. G case, when we use a one-size-fits-all approach in a society where people are not one size in terms of their experiences and their needs. The ombudsman and the public protector is one of the examples that modern societies can use. And in South Africa, the architects of our democracy had that vision to create an ombudsman. It's not the only administrative oversight structure they created. They created also a human rights commission. They created uh, a gender commission and the commission on the rights of cultural and linguistic communities. And if now, if you're in a multicultural society and you can't go to court because it's a complex system, you can go to an ombudsman. But how should these ombudsman offices function more effectively? We have learned the hard way is the Power Protector South Africa. The first thing that we did was to have these offices all over the country. We've got 20 and we keep trying to increase them. And that's great. People enjoy that. We also have outreach. We had outreach, which is a one-to-one. -one. Because what I've learned uh, with people is that they want to talk. They want face-to-face -face thing, especially simple, uh, our simple people. <coughs> thirdly, what we did thirdly was most of our 
interaction is one-to-one. -one. Most ombudsmen do it telephonically or in writing. We don't do it like that, one-to-one. -one. And the beauty of that is that it reduces disempowerment. It gives people agency. When I started as a power protector, I thought this was going to be a refuge for people. In the end, I learned that it's not a refuge. It was an instrument to empower them by leveling the playing field between government and the people. Once the level playing field is, is leveled, when, once the field is leveled, trust is built. I mean, I've got an interesting case of a certain Mr. Skosan who has owed money for government for months. The day he got the money, he was so happy. He was owed this money for 10 years. I mean, it's a long story. But he sat with government officials and eventually they, they agreed to give him the money. He became an ambassador for working within the system because he had seen the system work. He had sat there in a meeting with a minister, a deputy minister, director general, and they seen that through an ombudsman, the system is leveled. There's a system of respect, there's a system of human dignity, and he was allowed to use his own language. Because when we use lawyers, they're great, but you're disempowered because you don't know what's being said and how it impacts on your right. So that's one of the things that we've done, uh, ADR, what we call whispering truth to power using the ombudsman system. But the one thing that we learned, though, that we still need to do is language in a multicultural society. In South Africa, we're a multicultural society already, 11 official languages, but beyond that, those are just 11 official languages. There are other unofficial languages. Portuguese, Greek, and all, Swahili, I mean, local languages. No, no, Swahili is a foreign. But now having become an open, an open country after apartheid fell, we have foreigners. We had to quickly employ a French person in, in our office to assist us to translate some of the complaints that are written in French and to make sure that when we, see, we meet with French citizens or with French uh, refugees or residents, uh, we, we, we can respond to them. But the French are not the only ones. We have Arabic people, we have Chinese people can barely speak English. So in a multicultural society, it becomes important that institutions that serve justice have people who understand the language. Firstly, it allows you to understand them properly, but secondly, it makes them feel welcome if they can speak to somebody who understands their language. And um, that's something that we've learned uh, through the process. But what I'm advocating here is just the importance of using these institutions to strengthen constitutional democracy. What's the value for society is people trust the system and they want to operate in the system. People who feel I wasn't treated properly, I was treated with indignity, just from rudeness, can go to an ombudsman. Because you can't go to court and say an official was rude to me. But that could be the start of a dysfunctional existence, just being treated rudely. And these institutions are simple enough to do that. But I just thought, colleagues, that uh, having proposed that we should have these multi-agency guardians of human rights, including the ombudsman or the power protector, I just had one cautionary note on this particular issue, is let's beware of the guardians themselves. We come from these societies where difference is hierarchized. We always think that if you're different from me, there's better or worse. And that's how society, we come from a society where we fed ideas about what does it mean to be a South African and what's the difference between a South African and a foreigner, Muslim, Christian, etc. Those operate in the heads of those who are guardians of democracy as well guardians of human rights. So just, uh, um, if you think about the, the British Airways a story that I told you, the, the story that I read on the British Airways, when we think about the, the person who refused to sit next to, to the Muslim, I can imagine that in all of our heads, what comes up your, in, in your head is bigot, irrational, and if you may use a new word that I've, I've seen in, on Twitter, deplorable. 
We say those things because we think we're better than that person. But are we? Because the difference here is that this person articulates the premise from which he or she deals with Muslims. Do we always articulate the premise on which we deal with each other? Or we just find ourselves colliding without each other understanding why are we <laughs> colliding because of the un unarticulated premises of our interaction. I put it to you as a lawyer that we all bigoted. The difference is the extent of the bigotry and also how aware of ourselves are we. When we teach judges in South Africa on social context awareness, we tell them to start from the premise that you should understand that you are bigoted because you come from a society that hierarchizes difference, hierarchizes difference. And yours is to be aware and to transcend it. And then every time you deal with people, always ask yourself, from what premise am I doing this? As a case of a Dutch person, who was treated very, very badly. And at one stage when he was uh, imprisoned, it's a long story where they dropped the ball, but when he was in prison, he wrote this uh, poem about a cockroach. Then he said he imagined the people had treated him badly to be about a cockroach. So it ceased to being about the Dutch person who has been treated badly to be his colonial attitude towards South Africans. And firstly, I dealt with officials, but at some stage I had to deal with a very senior person, and guess what that senior person said to me? When we go to their countries, we understand it's not our country, and we behave properly. They should do the same here. But what's the underlying thinking there? Is that if you're not in your own country, service is a privilege. But our constitution doesn't say so. Our constitution says every human being is entitled to human rights. The Universal Declaration says so. It's not based on good behavior. It's just based on the fact that you are a human. So what then happens in most of our countries is that any mistake by a foreigner quickly descends into a reason why I shouldn't give them their rights. I'm not saying foreigners should treat locals badly. But I'm just saying, this is the case I learned in person where I had to say to this person, we're treated by local complainants badly ourselves. And I constantly have to counsel my own employees that let's distinguish it between the bad behavior of the complainant who has been traumatized and that's why they are uh, uh, basically projecting towards us and the actual injustice they have suffered. And I'm glad that my team has always been able to transcend the personality issues and focus on whether or not there was an injustice. Uh, but what's the storyline here? The guardians themselves should be careful of their own biases. And if we can, when we appoint the guardians, let's appoint the least biased of them all. Lastly, to the locals, I've already asked this question, does the what's in it for me question matter? In a multicultural society, to the average individual who has to embrace diversity, should it matter that diversity should work for them? My view is we should find out what people's aspirations are and find a way when we talk to them to say, how can it work? And that has been uh, discussed earlier uh, that uh, we have to ensure that people understand how diversity can work for them. I personally believe that hate is not the opposite um, of love. I actually believe that the opposite of love is fear. And I've experienced it in my own life where the people who have called me a spy, who have tried, uh, threatened to kill me and uh, released a lot of fake news about me, were not people who hated me. In fact, some of them, when I meet them, we have a nice cup of tea, you would think they're my good friends. They have unleashed all of that vitriol and all of those crazy things purely out of fear. Think of a drowning person. 
and try to save them, they're gonna kill you. It's all about fear, nothing to do with hate. So what does it happen? Why in South Africa we had xenophobic outbreaks? Fear. Fear of losing jobs. Fear of being unable to compete in the, in the economy as, as small business persons. Fear, security fears, drugs. Fear of men that are, we're not gonna compete in the market of getting girlfriends and wives. It's small. And those are fears. Calling them bigots, deplorables, is not going to help us. But engaging them on understanding humanity and understanding what's happening elsewhere. Why, are, why do people migrate sometimes involuntarily? <coughs> and understanding that at the, at the core of ourselves, we all human beings. In South Africa, where they're saying that says, umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu. A person is a person because of other people. And at the core of that is, is Ubuntu. And traditionally, Africans would give you more food as a stranger and go to bed hungry because of Ubuntu. But what was the understanding was that as humanity, the only way I am going to survive is, is if you too are alive because together we have a better chance of survival against the elements. And that's something we need to begin to, to bring back. Our constitutional court in South Africa has said that the protection of human dignity in our constitution is part of Ubuntu. At the core of that, at the core of the value of human dignity is the value of Ubuntu. And how then, what do we do? What are we to do, me and you? Well, firstly, I'm preaching to the choir. You're sitting here on a Sunday <laughs> after a very long conference because you already are doing work to create a better world for us all. So I can't sit here and preach and say do better. All I can say is continue to do whatever it is you're doing to create a world that embraces multiculturalism. And don't worry that what you're doing may be little. If you ever did worry, think of a mosquito. It is so tiny, but it can do a lot. That's an African proverb, and I think it's from Nigeria. Thank you. Holiday blessings to all of you. Thank you very, very much for an inspiring speech in many ways. Be happy to take questions and comments. So before you leave the podium, yes. Thanks very much for this very inspiring, as Mark said, and it's eye-opening, um, especially about justice and democracy. Um, with regard to democracy, um, it is true that the few decide for the many, and that is happening across the world in all democratic systems. But it is really within democracy that people exercise their right not to participate. Nobody uh, has stopped them from taking their right. But uh, is it fair, I mean, to ask the question again, is it fair to force them to participate, to attend meetings, to, se to select candidates? Some countries have done such a thing. For example, Brazil. Um, uh, imposed um, a fine on any citizen that doesn't vote. Um, but that hasn't really changed uh, a lot in the system. It, maybe it has um, pushed some people to uh, vote, but uh, many people didn't vote and they just paid the fine. So it is a democratic right. It's, it is just um, to allow people not to participate if they wish. Um, you and I, I'm sure, would like to see everyone participating because we would like to know what people think. And I think people should have no right to protest later on if they have not participated in the, in the political process. 
But then again, it is not fair to impose on them um, that they must participate when they don't wish to. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for that question, Say. I do agree with you absolutely that um, people should not be forced to vote. And secondly, that they make that choice not to vote. But here's the difference. Do they make that choice voluntarily? Or do they make that choice because they've reached a point where they say the, the system is not working for them? I, I spoke about violence being the language of the disempowered, but also saying that violence is not everything. My own son voted for the first time this year. He's 28. He voted for the first time this year in local government elections. And why did he vote? Towards the local government elections, there was a sense that voting will mean something. People, over when we got democracy about 22 years ago, most of us, I would say most black people in South Africa, had been part of the liberation movement and, and part of the African National Congress, either members or supporters. And over the years, people started feeling that they were not always happy with the people. They were happy with the party, they were not always happy with the people. And some felt that it wouldn't make a difference. And then we have race, uh, politics of race in South Africa, where people would say, okay, I wouldn't vote for the DA because it's white, but also I don't like their approach to equality and things like that. I wouldn't vote for this. So that's that. At the end, people like my son felt they don't have an option. And then they don't vote through the system. Local government elections, they voted because they started feeling that political monopoly was beginning to disintegrate. But what is the other answer? Institutions such as the power protector, where, when I'm talking about democracy, I'm thinking about modern democracy where Citizen involvement is not just through the ballot box. We have to look at other means through which citizens can have a say. And the ombudsman is one way where they can engage with government. Because they always say democracy is a dialogue between the citizens or between the people and those they've entrusted with public power. Political process, the political process is part of democracy. The courts are part of democracy. In a constitutional democracy, going to court is part of exercising democracy and coming to a power protector. You can engage through the media, you can engage through referenda, and you could also engage on a one-to-one. -one. In South Africa, they've created multiple platforms of engaging with government. That's why sometimes when people operate outside the system, you, you wonder why. And I believe that the problem in South Africa is that not everyone knows what the platforms are because there are multiple platforms to engage with those who are entrusted with public power. And that was the vision behind the creation of South Africa because former President Nelson Mandela said, even the most benevolent of governments have within them propensities for human failings. And that's why we've built into our architecture various mechanisms for accountability. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Are you prepared to take two more questions or comments? Okay, very quick one, sir. Very quick, okay. Um, I agree with your uh, response to the last question um, because uh, it's not black and white. I mean, uh, when you look at electoral laws uh, for parliament, for example, where does democracy start? stop? I mean, it, at the end of the day, it's the parliamentarians that are going to approve this law and they're obviously going to approve it to make sure that they come back again. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I know of at least one country where the electoral law is designed um, in a very non-homogeneous manner, uh, just to make sure that, uh, and I'm sure there are other countries, uh, I'm talking about Lebanon, my own country, and uh, I'm sure there are other countries that are similar. So, no, I, I, I think uh, in this specific case, when the parliament is uh, involved in the process of, um, I don't know how to put it, but 
to make sure that uh, they come back to their seats uh, one way or the other, um, that uh, you know people should be forced to 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 go and vote. It's it's a, it's their right. It's the national right. Uh, so it's not black and white. Uh, it's not a matter of. Uh, uh, you know, if you ask somebody to go and vote that this is not democratic, obviously there are cases when, you know, a citizen uh, may be forced not to vote. But uh, I'm saying uh, this is one way to perhaps change the system in, a, in, in one step at a time. But when, when you uh, have an electoral vote that is uh, designed for a specific, you know, uh, result, and they all know that result up to a 90% accuracy, what it will be. Uh, and then you end up with 40% that go to vote. No, in this case, they should go vote. It, it should be uh, required that they, they should go vote. So I'm, that's why I'm saying it's not black and white. And that's why the response of it depends why they're not voting is just perfectly answered. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Say. Well, that was a comment. And, um, but the idea is we have to find ways to get citizens involved in the system. Because I think system, citizens that work within the system and complain within the system are safe citizens. And they're not a threat to national security. Often governments think that we should stop people from complaining, we should stop people from talking. I think when they stop complaining and they stop talking, and that's when they become a danger because they think about self-help, they feel disempowered, and then violence becomes the language of the disempowered. The last one. Yeah, the last second. one. I've been remembering the case you saved this man from not being, from losing his money, he lost his house, was so he lost the family. Uh, but he, of course, probably due to lack of time, he didn't really uh, completely clear. What, what happened? How did you? How did you compensate this man for losing the family? As much as he might pay back the money and so on, what about the family? What happened to, 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 to that loss? Did you ever put her, him back to where he was before he lost the wife, the, the family? <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I like using human stories because we can then move from concepts to real human lives. And Mr. G's story takes us back to what is it all about? It's about creating a better world for all of us, and uh, not for some of us, for all of us. He, he didn't lose his family in this particular case. He was on the verge of losing his family. And um, unfortunately, that particular mayor agreed to pay and didn't pay. And then the local government elections came and there was change of regime and he's been picked. And that's the sad point. But it's not the only person who comes to us when they are on the verge of losing their homes and their family. I had a soldier who lost his house, just talking about an ombudsman. Literally, in the middle of our investigation, he lost his house. It's the only case where I cried because I was still new as a public protector and, you know, and being that crusader for justice, wanting to make sure that when there's an injustice, it must be corrected. But again, using the uniqueness of an ombudsman institution, this house he lost had nothing to do, had not been bought by government. So that legal nexus between the house and government was not there. The nexus was that government had promised to pay him an increased pension for all the soldiers, and government kept delaying and paying it. They kept giving a date and not paying, giving a date and not paying. Then he undertook this liability because he was expecting the money. 
And even the minister, it was Minister Sosolo then, he agreed with, she agreed with us, and she promised too that the money would be paid. And then we kept going to the bank. That's the beauty of an ombudsman. You can call the bank and say, please don't sell his house, we're still sorting it out. And the bank would not sell his house. But when government kept not ma making promises and wasn't keeping, the bank sold this house. I was left with the situation of the bank, the government had not bought him the house, but he lost it because government failed to do what it was supposed to do. What do I do? I got government to give him a house. So initially they met him, they made him leave in the officer's mess. Eventually they paid him back his house. And that's the ability, the, the good thing about the ombudsman, in South Africa you have the power to investigate, to report, and to take appropriate remedial action. You have the power to investigate, report, and take appropriate remedial action. The beauty of appropriate is that appropriate means discretionary power in terms of what would be appropriate in each circumstance. In this particular case, um, the appropriate thing was he should get his house. Yes. Thank you, sir.